This week, I'm joined by Jack Zipes, who is a professor of German, comparative literature and cultural studies. In this episode, we discuss the ideas of Ernst Bloch alongside discussions on hope, Marxism, fascism, atheism and more. As always, I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast, gain access to some exclusive content, or just keep everything running as it runs off donations alone, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. Okay, so Jack Zipes, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Yes, I'm glad to be here. Uh, we are going to be discussing the work of Ernst Bloch, primarily taking inspiration and influence from your book, which was published in 2019 by Palgrave Macmillan, Ernst Bloch, The Pugnacious Philosopher of Hope, um, titled as such because I think even though Bloch's not extremely well known outside of maybe Marxist circles or certain circles, he would be known for his three-volume work, work, The Principle of Hope. Um, so... Uh, We'll be discussing block, we'll be discussing the idea of hope, we'll be discussing religion, the Bible, all these sorts of strange, <laughs> peculiar things which Block somehow manages to get himself into. Uh, he's a polymath, uh, all over the shot, really, really fant fantastic figure and fantastic book. Um, but before we begin, Jack, uh, you, you know, you had an extremely long career, uh, which perhaps doesn't seem directly related to the work of Ernst Bloch. So just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, your career and why it was amidst your career of myth and fairy tale, um, yes. why you decided to write this book. Yes. Uh, well, to begin with, um, I, I studied at uh, Dartmouth College for a master's degree uh, and, uh, from, uh, and majored in political science at, at uh, Dartmouth, and then I went on to Columbia University in New York, uh, where I, uh, actually my interest was in American literature, American and comparative literature. And um, uh, while I was uh, studying, I, I tried to set a record and get a doctorate in two years, and I burned out. Uh, and I also had an unfortunate romance, and I decided, uh, at that time, for some strange reason, oh, I, I know what the reason was. Well, it was a strange reason. A good friend of mine who had been my roommate at Dartmouth College uh, kept writing to me. He left Dartmouth. He got fed up with it. And uh, uh, he, he traveled into the mid uh, Middle East and, um, and also to uh, the continent and kept writing me and said, if you really want to know uh, what being Jewish means, you should go to Germany. Now, hmm. That was strange because, of course, I I've, I've, I thought at that time that most Germans were probably still Nazi Nazis or something like that. I came from a, a Jewish family that was very adamant in its, uh, let, let us say, understanding of Germany or non-understanding of Germany. Hmm. Uh, at any rate, I, I, I had to, I, I had to, have a reading knowledge of German, French, and Latin and, and, uh, for my PhD in English and comparative literature. And I decided, I, I took a night class in German, and I sort of fell in love with Kafka and also the teacher, who was a, a, a wonderful, beautiful German woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided that I had to leave after being burned out after two years, and I went to Munich. Um, uh, despite the protests of my family and my friends, because I, um, uh, uh, my one friend who was writing all of these letters made it seem uh, extremely important to go. Mm -hmm. And he was right. It turned out that I realized uh, I, I, I spent two years instead of one year there. Mm -hmm. I lived in Munich and some other places in northern uh, Germany. And I realized that the younger generation, uh, which had nothing to do, you know, with Nazism and fascism and so on, was really suffering tremendously uh, because if, if either their parents were Nazis or mm -hmm. the, or they, uh, to a certain extent, uh, were uh, uh, complicit uh, with what uh, what happened, uh, and they kept silent. They didn't talk with their children about what happened and why they did what they did and so on. 
And I realized that the, the this young generation was going to uh, uh, really go in a different path. And, and I could, there were already signs that the young Germans were going to Israel uh, you know, to, uh, to try to make up in some way or, or, or just see what was going on there. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, I began to also search my own Jewishness and uh, I was heavily influenced by Sartre's book uh, on uh, anti-Semitism and Jews. And um, so I came back to uh, New York uh, with a really strong knowledge of German and German philosophy and literature and so on after spending two years there. Uh, I finished my degree un then under the tremendous influence of, um, uh, of the Frankfurt School, uh, one of the uh, most in, in, important uh, uh, critics uh, I, I read at that time was Herbert Marcuse, who was, uh, as you probably know, a, a major figure, at least in the United States, when it came to the student movement in the 1960s. He wrote a book called One Dimensional Man and a book also on Eros. Uh, uh, so he was the first uh, sort of major critical figure who influenced me and influenced me to begin reading uh, Theodore Adorno or, or Walter Benjamin and so on at the Frankfurt School. Uh, and up to this point in the 1970s, I had not really heard of Ernst Bach, um, although uh, I did go back. Uh, at, uh, uh, to teach at, at the University of Munich, Munich after I got my degree in 1965, I moved back uh, to Germany and spent another two, uh, three years uh, in Europe. And at that time, again, I, that's when I discovered Ernst Bloch and uh, took, began taking an interest in his work, even though uh, he and the Frankfurt School had many uh, disputes with one another. Uh, most of the, uh, what, what is interesting, by the way, is that Enns Bloch, who was of a different generation than most of the members of the Frankfurt School, Enns Bloch, uh, 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 they were all afraid of him, hmm. <laughs> which was surprising. I mean, these are brilliant minds, but uh, evidently Enns Bloch was a, uh, and he wasn't aggressive or anything. It was just that he was uh, had his own ideas that uh, uh, sometimes similar, but uh, he would uh, he was not as uh, uh, sociologically based. Uh, he was he was a mixture, a strange mixture of uh, the Bible, hmm. uh, the uh, 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 what I would call. Uh, expressionism uh, and, and anarchism. Uh, he he really did not have you. You could not sort of uh, describe him. You uh, well, you could try to describe him, but uh, because he was uh, so fascinated uh, by many different things, that uh, truly his philosophy, his uh, unique philosophy. Um, is much different than anything uh, the Frankfurt School members ever tried to do. Uh, so uh, I, I became intrigued uh, with Bloch in the uh, 1970s. I had been, uh, a, a, after my stint in, in, in Europe, I came back to the United States uh, at the end of, in, I think it was 1967, just as the uh, student movement was ex exploding uh, the Vietnam War was going on. I, I joined uh, various left-wing organizations, and um, I was very active politically uh, to the point that when the Kent State murders happened in 1970, and all the universities in, in, in the United States uh, really protested, and, and there was also in Jackson State, which was a and a black university or black university uh, that too there were there were killings there 
and I became the head of the strike at NYU, hmm. uh, and uh, had to, and, and we we took over various buildings. Uh, fortunately, uh, I had a vote as, as and I I didn't want to be the head of the strike, but I was sort of one of the few young professors who had his foot in many different organizations, and they thought that I would be uh, a fair in in in, uh, in developing our movement at NYU. So uh, we took over six buildings, and and we we taught courses on uh, war, on mm-hmm. uh, uh, anti-war, on racism, and so on and so forth. And that went on for two weeks, and I was deb- and in one building supposedly there was dynamite uh, be- because they uh, were trying were uh, SDS and other organizations, the weathermen had infiltrated uh, in, into our organization. And um, I, I had to debate the president almost every day of the university. And he kept telling me, this is your, you're never going to get a job in America after this. And indeed, I did, I was blacklisted uh, for, for a long time. And uh, so uh, when that ended uh, uh, in positive ways. Uh, nobody blew up a building, mm-hmm. although they did try to blow up uh, the building. And uh, I and two of the uh, young professors who were friends of mine were brought before uh, a, a jury, as, as was I, by the way. Uh, and they, they were actually uh, instrumental in, in bringing this dynamite to this building. I had no no knowledge of this, and I, I we we had also taken a vote in our group not to do anything violent, and so that was on record. And there were spies. I mean, we were we didn't care. We were we dealt with everything very openly. There were no secrets. We wanted the war to stop, mm-hmm. and uh, and we were successful. Uh, f- fortunately for me, after I, uh, after 1970. I had two more years on my contract, and a a young member of of the uh, named Hans Meyer, uh, uh, a very famous uh, literary critic who uh, had taught in East Germany and fled East Germany, went to West Germany uh, in the nineteen sixties. Um, he came to uh, New York, and I translated two of his books. And uh, he received a guest professorship uh, at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And uh, I, I laughed I, because I was a very biased New Yorker. And I said, well, you're going to go to a desert and nobody knows anything out there. And, and, but Hans Meyer was very interest, intrigued by going to the Midwest. And uh, he also knew that I was being blacklisted all over the place. And when he was there after several months, he was one of these amazing uh, uh, German professors who was very blunt and had a strong accent. And he went at one point to the dean and said, you hire Zipes. <laughs> he needs a job and he's great. Or something like that, and, and so the dean was so frightened, I think, uh, by Meyer that when I went to a modern language association meeting in Chicago, they said, "Please come up here. We want to, <laughs> we want to talk to you about hiring you." And in fact, they, they did. And uh, in 1972, I moved to uh, uh, with uh, with my girlfriend at that time. We moved to uh, Milwaukee. And I, I uh, thinking, I always thought that, well, at the end of a year or two, I, I'll get an offer somewhere. But the blacklist lasted quite some time. And I, I taught there for 14 years. And it was there that I also found, co-founded uh, with two friends in Madison, Wisconsin, a journal called New German Critique. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, I also, by the way, switched fields. I, I I did teach American literature for a while, but then I switched to teach German literature uh, and uh, began to take in an interest in folklore, mm-hmm. uh, mainly because of the fact that my girl, my girlfriend. These are all strange ways that that you 
end up doing things that you never thought you would do. Mm -hmm. So my girlfriend was getting a PhD in uh, children's education, and I began reading all her books. Hmm. And one of the reasons I was really interested in children is that after we stopped the war in Vietnam, uh, every, most of the political organizations uh, abandoned uh, their, let us say, principles uh, or, or just left. And, and most of these students were from middle class and upper middle class families. They had it good. They could, you know, so now we've won, we've won the war, so in quotes, uh, and we can rest and just go about our ways and enjoy life. And I, I, I felt that our work had just begun. It's sort of this uh, motto of <laughs> Ants Bluff, so to speak, after the happy end, your work really, that's when your, your work really begins. And I wanted to find out what was it among the young, young people what, uh, that they could uh, sort of desert the uh, principles that they live by or, or, or trying to develop and, and, and not take care to continue developing a, a real democracy in America. And, uh, and that led me uh, to uh, children's literature, uh, to study, begin studying children's literature, which I had never done before. And, it began, and I began also reading many fairy tales and so on and so forth. And uh, I also uh, went into public schools for a year Te uh, telling stories so I could learn from, from the children themselves how they receive these stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of all of this work, my, I, be I began writing my first book uh, called Breaking the Magic Spell that uh, I believe it came out in 1979. Mm -hmm. And in, in that book, uh, uh, by this time, I had heard of and read, I was beginning to read Ernst Bloch. And uh, so two of the chapters in my very first book in 1979 actually dealt with his ideas. There's an essay on Tolkien and, and, and Bloch, uh, an essay, uh, a general essay in which I introduced his ideas via uh, George Lukács. Uh, they had been friends, uh, but they broke with one another. And uh, fortunately, Bloch went a different path than, than uh, the dogmatic, pedantic uh, uh, Lukács, although Lukács was also extremely important. And uh, I, I, I don't want to make fun of him. He was a brilliant man, a brilliant scholar, and, and, and really, uh, uh, but stuck to uh, sort of uh, a pedantic communism, I would call it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which, and that was not Bloch by any means. So that led me, uh, the, the journal, uh, the journal that be, became the major journal in the field of German literature in America, uh, be, because um, most of the other journals were very conservative and uh, founded actually by uh, Germans who had come over to America in the 1930s. Uh, uh, and they were more cautious and conservative than uh, some young young. Uh, Germanistin, uh, we were called Germanistin, I guess, a Germanist at that time. Uh, and so we, we actually um, uh, pioneered uh, the study of German literature and philosophy and economy and political science with this journal in, in uh, beginning, uh, I think, yeah, 1975, we founded it. And it's still uh, in other hands now. Uh, and it, it has a long history and still uh, do, doing quite wow. well. It's, it's no longer uh, a pioneer of mm -hmm. anything. <laughs> it's, it's become more conservative in, in, in many ways. So that, that uh, uh, eventually uh, led me, my, my first introduction to Bloch, the reading Bloch uh, and reading the three volumes of uh, of, on, on hope, uh, that uh, I decided uh, to translate a, a, a book. Um, uh, let's see, I'm, I, I've taken some 
notes here uh, so I can re remember everything. But I wrote a book in 1987 called The Utopian Function of Art and Literature. Uh, actually, I didn't write that book. Hmm. I edited it. It were essays by, uh, uh, by Bloch mm. on mm. art and literature. And I did that with Frank Mecl Mecklenburg. And that was the fir very first, uh, I think, any book, no one had, had written in America anything on Ernst Bloch. And in fact, uh, Ernst Bloch was, uh, there had been a couple of books translated, of, uh, but they were his sort of books on religion. Uh, so he was known in America at first by, uh, 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 by, uh, uh, ministers by, uh, uh, by by church people mm -hmm. uh, who uh, saw some uh, the, the religious side uh, uh, to his work uh, based on faith and uh, hope and uh, charity and compassion and so on and so forth. So so st uh, strange to say, even though Bloch was uh, a, an atheist. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, the uh, the theoreticians or uh, the, the uh, uh, religious theoreticians took his work very seriously and began talking, writing and talking about him. And uh, my book was uh, my book or translation of of his uh, essays dealt more with uh, literature and art and his notions of foreshine of. Uh, of uh, anticipatory illumination uh, 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 were developed in, in, in that particular book. And so um, uh, after that book, uh, I uh, became more uh, interested in, uh, in the folk and fairy tales and trying to develop my own philosophy, my own approach to folk and fairy tales. I was considered at first very dangerous by the folklorist in America. It, seriously, there were, it's a, an essay uh, 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 denouncing me in the <laughs> Journal of Folklore. <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, what happened was uh, it backfired because uh, the younger uh, uh, students and, 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 and uh, uh, professors who dealt with folklore in America became intrigued by my political approach to folk and fairy tales. And uh, that led to, uh, uh, I continued to write on Germans and Jews, uh, many different essays. And uh, it fi finally, uh, uh, it, during my retirement in 2008, I decided that it's time for me to uh, bunch my essays on Bloch to, uh, by this time in Germany, there was a Ernst Bloch Gesellschaft uh, Society mm -hmm. uh, that was very, very important. There were numerous books. Uh, he, he became he came into his own after his death. Mm -hmm. He had been, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, because he had gone at one point uh, in his journey from, well, he came to America during World War II uh, in 1938. Uh, stayed there until the McCarthy era uh, uh, began in, in, in America and fled, I think it was in uh, 1948 or so, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, East Germany, not West Germany, because he felt like that East Germany might uh, uh, really develop socialism uh, in a de democratic way and that uh, most of the Nazis who had been professors were in the West West Germany that uh, East Germany purged uh, most of the professors who had been uh, associated with Nazism. And so that's why he went, uh, he and his wife went to uh, East Germany, uh, as I said, I think it was uh, 1948 or so. And, uh, and then he stayed there, but things became, because he was so outspoken and simply because he was uh, uh, developing uh, a, an unusual theories of what socialism should do or could do, uh, and it was very uh, unusual theories that he developed, 
and uh, he was outspoken about uh, the oppression of many of his colleagues in East Germany, and he had to flee in 1961 to West Germany. <laughs> and in his, he was, I think, 63 or so, or, or older. And, uh, and once he got there, he received a, for the first time in his life, he could teach. Uh, up until that point, he lived uh, as a journalist uh, from his, the royalties from his books and so on. Some perhaps uh, he inherited, I'm, I'm not too sure about this, but uh, his wife, also, when they came to America, his wife supported him uh, for, uh, uh, during his entire time uh, be, uh, because he was writing the three volumes of, on, on hope mm -hmm. in, in the Boston and uh, Harvard Library. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, it's strange, in capitalist America, he was developing his unusual uh, philosophy of hope. And uh, so... Uh, in, in Germany, uh, when he came back and received a professorship at uh, the University of Tübingen, where I studied, by the way, mm -hmm. um, he, uh, he was also denounced uh, be, because of, and, and one of the first essays or talks he gave was, Can Hope Be Disappointed? Uh, and he tried to explain to a certain extent, uh, the mistakes that he had made with regard to Stalinism. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very honest and open and, and, and did not hide the fact that he had made a uh, wrong move, so to speak, that he, he had believed that, you know, maybe uh, in, in East Germany or in, or in Russia after World War II, uh, that there might be more of a chance there to really have social democracy, mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, but he, he quickly yeah. saw yeah. that that. I I guess just to open up his philosophy, as you've mentioned it there, as we're at the section of his life with hope. I mean, just to open yes. up with that big question for Ernst Bloch, uh, you know, how does he understand hope? Why is that such a key feature for him, or key of key importance? Yes. Well, for, for, for Bloch, hope was, uh, you, hope is both a verb and a noun. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, for Bloch, uh, it, it, uh, it was never, as, as a noun, it could never become a commodity like most uh, people think of hope as something you can box and, and keep and cherish and maybe look at, and it might give you some, uh, some, uh, something that would enable you to live in our very complicated world. Mm -hmm. uh, but for for uh, uh, Bloch, uh, was much more concerned with hope as a verb that uh, that uh, hope can propel people uh, to. Uh, create a more humane society in which people share collectively uh, the goods that they produce. And his writings tended to uh, also focus on what is it that human beings have to do in order to uh, uh, use hope as a verb uh, to move forward, to develop a process of, uh, of truth that will expose what is wrong so that people can unite, unite, and, uh, and produce a society in which there is compassion, mm -hmm. humanity, and understanding about what is really going on. For instance, uh, he... Uh, I loved uh, what one of his notions was that uh, uh, w w th there were certain sort of key notions that I love that he developed. And one of them was uh, that we have to strive for the Aufrechte Gang, mm -hmm. uh, which means the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, moving from an ape instead of, uh, of, of, of walking like an ape, 
in order to stand upright mm -hmm. and move forward, uh, we had to overcome the apeness, mm -hmm. the, 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 the type of brutality, the uh, uh, beastly way that we lead our lives. Mm -hmm. So for him, uh, in order to, uh, <clears throat> to move forward, we, there were certain things that we that were required, and one was to learn learn all about the Aufrechtegang, to learn about uh, one of, one of the things that I, I one of his really best books that uh, that people uh, uh, don't know uh, uh, that much about is uh, the a book that deals. I'm I'm, I'm trying to. Uh, uh, that deals with ungleichzeitigkeit or non sick uh, 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 non uh, uh, okay non synchronism uh, and and this is the Ebschaft unserer Zeit or Heritage of Our Times, a book that was written in 1933, and in that book, uh, and it's very relevant today, extremely relevant today. He wrote this right in. 1933, 34, 35. It was a group of, of essays he had written, and he wanted to sh to demonstrate that if hope is going to be realized, then we have to uh, develop a, uh, a a society in which there is synchronicity, uh, and and by that he meant equal. We would say equality today, mm -hmm. in in which there has to be complete equality and one of the reasons why fascism and and that's and it is so valid today and one of the reasons there's fascism we're, we're leaving we're living in what i call in america i don't know about you in the uk in a, a soft fascism soft fascism mm -hmm. uh uh and by that i mean it's a subtle type of fascism or not too subtle given so you don't, given you, don't Trump. Consider, you don't consider it a democracy at all. Oh no, no, not at all. We're not living in a democracy. Look, look, the high, the Supreme Court has uh, five members who are staunch right wingers, and and have just uh, uh, and and are uh, 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 condoning certain uh, actions. We're, uh, in America, which is opposed by the majority of people, mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that a democracy? That 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 uh, that uh, nine uh, somewhat stupid people, uh, religious people, right wing religious people, uh, can uh, make decisions for mm -hmm. millions of people who don't believe in what they uh, in, in that decision? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, can a, a somebody like uh, uh, like uh, Trump still continue to subvert the democracy that we have and has something like forty million followers? Mm -hmm. That's not a democracy. So, That's not so your your view is sort of Blockian in the sense that Block has this, even though he has these sympathies. He has many political sympathies, which are very difficult to untangle. I mean, he has sympathies with Stalin, which he comes to repute and discuss, but he has mostly sympathies with socialism. But on the same angle, he's a religious anarchist. So it seems to me that yes. your your own major sympathies are in line with Bloch, that really his major problem is with general authority, authoritarianism. Yes. Exactly, exactly. You got it. Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, in, in terms of... What he tried to do, what he tried to explain in this in this particular book and in, in, in the different essays, is that people are suffering. The majority of people are, are suffering in this world today, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, and because they and and that's because of this non synchronicity, that that uh, or what or uh, non or one could say non equality, mm -hmm. that. That the people from the poor classes are living in poverty, and 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 they feel and uh, that they need something. They need a messiah. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened? What, what is happening is 
the Messiah in Germany mm -hmm. uh, came about because the Communist Party and the Socialist Party fought each other mm -hmm. and uh, allowed the fascists to promise them something that they could never give them. In, in, in other words, uh, uh, for a while, of course, you, you know, Hitler, uh, there was, th this was a period, we have to look at everything socio-historically. Uh, Hitler came to power to be because of the fact that the left wing was split mm -hmm. uh, be, uh, be, and, and, and people were suffering. And they didn't. Pay, they didn't. The left wing did not pay attention. This is something I, I was. I was extremely happy that you brought this up actually now and in the book yes. because I'm going to be the controversial person, right, and say that there's very few left wing people, or Marxists, that want to admit this. That once again, we're actually seeing a repeat of this. That as you're saying, there was the the, the communist socialist or the left wing infighting, which yes. what you're saying now and in the book you're saying is that in in that infighting, they ignored the actual struggle of the poor classes, of the working class, and fascism, uh, that allowed fascism, uh, as for your reading and Bloch's reading in a way, to come in and be that sympathetic side. And we actually see a complete repeat of this, for anyone who is of that left sympathy, see a repeat of this in the UK with the infighting between Labour, etc., and those left-wing parties and the Conservatives coming into uh, working-class areas and doing the exact same thing. Same with, I would imagine you would probably say the same thing in America, right? Yes. That the, the left infighting is really uh, what Bloch would call that that decency, which ends up indecency because you end up ignoring the the, the suffering, the yes. actual suffering. Yes, exactly. You can say I could say it any better than than what you just said. Uh, it's this uh, the infighting uh, enabled uh, the, the Nazis to provide to a certain extent uh, some hope, okay, mm -hmm. for them that their lives would become better if they followed Hitler. Hitler would provide them with jobs and so on and so forth. The same thing is going on in America today. The uneducated, deprived people mm -hmm. in America are falling for everything that not only Bloch is saying, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, Bloch, not, mm -hmm. not only Trump is saying, but uh, the uh, it, it spread to all these senators, to right-wing senators. It's uh, throughout the the uh, the country in in America, at least thirty million people or more believe in in Trump and believe all the misinformation that is being said. It's a mis mm. uh, it's sort of a deformed hope that they're 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 probably uh, it, just just to just to push push back a little on that because yes. often my viewers say that I don't push back enough. Isn't <laughs> uh, isn't constraining this thirty million people's hope? saying that it's false, isn't that sort of denying their own agency to to decide what it is they, they believe in? Uh, not, not, not really. It's, uh, I, I would say uh, that we're not doing enough. Uh, again, the problem is, uh, what is the Democratic Party, which is basically a very conservative party uh, filled with uh, a lot of cowards also, and, mm. and uh, uh, the, the uh, the the left wing in in, in America. The, well, let me put it this way: the Democrats are not doing enough uh, to fulfill, uh, to combat, and uh, uh, they're fighting among themselves. Also, in America, there's a progressive. De uh, there are many progressive Democrats who are fighting the conservative Democrats, and so what is happening is that uh, the uh, right wing uh, uh, Trump can insert themselves uh, as and and pre and pre and try to demonstrate that if you follow me, I'm wow. honest, I'm blunt, I will give you what you really need. Uh, all of that is going on here in America right now, as it was going on in Germany in the 1930s, mm -hmm. and uh, and so uh, to a certain extent. It is the fault of the left wing if fascism comes about in its reality. It's no longer soft fascism. Then uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, perhaps uh, 
have a period that in which racism, sexism, and so on, all the things that 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 uh, have been semi overcome, mm. they're not totally overcome, uh, are 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 going to continue to develop in such a way that people will not have will not be able to determine their future. This is what Bloch hoped, that people together could determine their future. That's what, he was an existentialist, he was an expressionist. His writing is very difficult to understand sometimes, but he had hope, he had faith, and this is his religion, he had faith in the human beings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but that, yes, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, this. I think this is strangely... Um, and this is this is some of the most exciting stuff I think you wrote. And I, when I saw it in the the um, let's call it table of chapters, I was so excited to get to it. I might have skipped ahead, but I think this is actually a good bit to bring in Tolkien and what we were talking about earlier with in relation to the, his idea of a Messiah, right? So right. Block beginning from look, there is suffering, and this is actually something I think a lot of left left wing people. I'm 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 not left wing. I'm all over the place. But this is a lot. <laughs> what a lot of left wing people I think ignore is that there will always be suffering in that very Christian sense of bear your cross. There is going to be suffering. Bloch is also accepting that, that his foundation is suffering. And so Bloch and Tolkien beginning from that foundation of two forms of hope and one, one is secular and one is, one is Catholic for Tolkien, but it's that, that sense of a hope, which has already gone beyond the position where there's no sociological hope. Right, so you've already gone beyond the point of no hope. So you're, you're now in this position of like hope for its own sake. And then, um, you know what what you're talking about with the idea of the democrats and republicans and that spectrum you know and almost you am i right in saying, thinking that you're almost saying that you're all on the same spectrum none of you are going beyond none of you are you know what what block would call you know a beyondness or an overshoot none of you are going beyond this very small talking point you're constraining hope to something very small and in that sense that hope never really comes about yeah, I, I I agree. Uh, I I think that uh, for for Bloch doesn't put the blame of uh, the disappointment of hope on any particular group or mm. people or whatever. Uh, he uh, continues. He continued until his death to believe that human beings can. Uh, uh, learn if 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 they uh, take the smallest things in life, the, the traces of 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 goodness, trace uh, traces of bravery, traces of enlightenment. If all of these things uh, can be uh, used for the benefit of people, uh, then we can realize hope. That hope can. Uh, be not just uh, a noun, hope uh, can propel us uh, to fulfill, to realize uh, the benefits uh, or the fruit that we all produce. Uh, I mean, it's a very socialist idea and, and it's not dogmatic or pedantic or anything like that. He, he is somebody who, who wanted to point out what is missing in our lives and how can how can we uh, uh how can we find how, how can we uh develop what is missing into what is real mm. and uh and therefore uh, consequently uh, we must continue to critique and and to uh at the same time be creative and use our imaginations. Here's where fairy tales or literature or art or literature comes into being, because literature and art and fairy tales can uh, estrange us from ourselves mm -hmm. uh, so that we can understand what is happening, perhaps, and, and, and the magic of, of literature, of art, and so on, is... Uh, uh, sort of enabling us, or, or it's a, it's what he called a uh, anticipatory illumination. The foreshine can can show us the way if we open uh, ourselves up uh, to all of these 
little small gains, what, what he called spuren, mm -hmm. uh, the traces, there are traces that we've left behind where uh, 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 collectives were built in the past and so on. If we can re re reutilize uh, these, the history of what was good in, in, in people's lives, then we might be able to, in the future, mm -hmm. uh, produce our own sort of uh, idealistic uh, socialism in, in the world. And so that's what, what, what Bluff was about. Uh, and and so there's a religious sort of... Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, this, so this is something you said. I mean, it's a socialist idea, but of course, uh, to draw in the work of uh, Eric Vogelin, if you're familiar with him, the idea of yes. immanentizing the eschaton, right, bringing the end to now. I mean, Vogelin says that that's not possible. And he's saying that Marxism, fascism, etc., all these isms have their own version of this, with Marxism saying the end... the the, the the heaven will be heaven on earth will be when we've seized the means of production right and the peculiar thing i guess for block is saying he's saying that there the, it only begins when we get to the end right there isn't we need to we need to yes. push through to the end and yes. then it begins and then there's a then there's an opening so it's almost in that very anarchic way which is also another thing which i guess the socialists wouldn't have liked right because there's a lot of <laughs> lot of infighting but you know people often bandy together anarchism, socialism, communism, but socialists and anarchists do not agree, right? Um, that very anarchic thing of any any authoritarian constrainment from anyism, really, if you're within it, you haven't you haven't gone beyond it. So it's almost mm -hmm. like not imminentizing the eschaton, but finding it and then just going beyond it somehow. Yes. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yes. <laughs> no, I agree. No, I, I, th I think you put it nicely, very nicely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's i mean it's it's such it's so peculiar it really is peculiar because it's not um you know i mean so then the question becomes when I mean, what is this beyond right but is it is it is it always mm -hmm. going to be something unseen unknown does it have to be unknown mm -hmm. uh, no not not really uh, be, be, because as, as i said before uh Bloch took say the French Revolution, mm -hmm. and 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 he says, uh, if if I recall correctly, he says that was a uh, a trace already, uh, a what he called a spur, a, a, a sense that you could realize briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, the the reasons why the French Revolution didn't continue or or did not develop into socialism and 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 so on is that the the conditions were not ripe enough mm -hmm. so uh in uh, uh and so for bloch uh it was really important to understand what the what the conditions of living are on earth uh so that uh we can move on to realize what is possible. He believed that there were what, what he called Möglichkeiten, possibilities, and that, uh, and that in, in hoping we uh, project or imagine possibilities that we can do. Mm -hmm. and, 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 on, and, and if the conditions are not ripe enough, uh, they will fail, but they will still make their mark. And these are the traces. They will make their mark in our lives mm -hmm. so that they won't die. They'll be there. They will have made their life. That's why it's important to know history and build on history, build on what is good and not evil. <laughs> and so uh, for Bloch, uh, there is a uh, something beyond that we can actually... Uh, realize mm -hmm. it, 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 it uh, it's not a question uh, it's not a question of whether you know what is out there uh, it's the, the question is uh, there is something out there mm -hmm. and, uh, and and we can realize it we have the possibilities we have to create the conditions uh, so that things that we imagine, and things that we have felt already uh, and know about 
can come together uh, so that uh, we can have a decent lives. Mm-hmm. Just, I mean, he's, he just wants some decency, some humanity. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I uh, uh, quite often joke among my friends that uh, 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 that that uh, today dogs are more humane than than we humans. Well, yeah, it's uh, an interesting idea. So, what what is for for block? What would be decency? Because I'll I'll, I'll uh, you know prod I guess prod prod a little bit and say that I think yes. the the world seems fairly fairly decent as is. I mean, but he sees this bourgeoisie sort of politeness as actually indecency. So, what is decency for Bloch? Uh, 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 well, decency involves compassion. Mm-hmm. Decency, I mean, uh, is it decent that Russia uh, is now uh, uh, killing hundreds of thousands of people or causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people? Is that decency or decent? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, uh, the uh, uh, decency involves uh, not sticking to the rules that uh, uh, elites establish. Decency is having compassion for people who suffer under pretension, the, the pretensions of decency. So it's mm-hmm. very complicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but uh, a decency uh, does not involve hard set rules. Decency involves feelings, compassion, and a hope that there can be something, a possibility to uh, relate to one another in different ways. Mm-hmm. What, was, what, was, what would be Ernst, what would be Bloch's sort of practical antidote to that? Is, could there ever be a formed way for, did he ever you know, give advice for people what to do in that sense? No, I, I mean, he, he, uh, he, he did write, about, he, he was not a philosopher who uh, sort of gave, or like a therapist of any kind. <laughs> uh, by it, in fact, he would, he, would, he would really dislike being, being called a therapist. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, he was trying, I think, to get to individual, he, he was he, he believed that every individual could live a more decent life, more compassionate life, and that, that again, this uh, notion that uh, walking with an upright gait. Uh, walking with an upright gait is, uh, is somebody who is very humane, mm-hmm. somebody who, who uh, is, not, is going to work with other people to share whatever uh, whatever fruits we all develop in the in the, in this world. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It all seems. Why isn't it as simple as it seems? What's in the way? <laughs> what's in the way? Maybe uh, maybe not materially. What's in the way? Um, you know, as we're talking I, uh, about I, talking about I, hope. I I I think what's in the way, and and and. This comes after a really, I, I say, a good part of my studies has been devoted to children and and to uh, um, and 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 there is a, a wonderful book on childism, and I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the author. I keep forgetting her name. Uh, that came out several years ago, and the I think what's in a way is the way we raise children. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's it's the way we educate our our, our babies are are very young, mm-hmm. uh, and and how they are treated and how they are uh, given or or helped in 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 a way uh, to become autonomous in a world uh, in which uh, freedom is very limited actually. Mm-hmm. So it, it gets back to to really how do we educate uh, all our children in an equal way, so that they relate to one another in 
in a more uh, humane and compassionate way and share everything that we produce, okay? How do we do that? Well, one of the ways that is blocking us is that children are, are, are raised uh, in uh, orthodox religious families, I don't care what the religion is, uh, to believe in, in stupidity, in, in idols that don't exist, or, or, uh, or they induce to believe that there are hardcore principles that uh, must be obeyed no matter what. Mm. And if you have uh, uh, a diverse, and I'm not saying there should be a systematic, uh, holistic way of raising children, but we have to change the way we raise children so that they don't believe in false, so they, they, they understand what is truth, mm. and that truth is a process. Not it's it, the truth again is not a noun, mm-hmm. it's a process. Uh, and if we don't do that, then we're are going to have uh, people will be easily misled if they are not alert and aware that mm-hmm. uh, uh, of what is going on in our world today when they come into this world, uh, then they will most likely be susceptible to fascism. Mm-hmm. What would you say to those who might say that uh, the truth can never be relative? Well, the truth is relative. I mean, uh, we can, we can, uh, in, in um, many ways, we can, uh, we we can demonstrate uh, uh, that uh, truth has to be relative because. Uh, uh, many of our truths are false. Uh, are false, mm-hmm. and so uh, in order for us to understand what is false and what is real or genuine, uh, we have to understand that truth is a process. It's relative, and uh, if if it if it fails to provide, uh, let us say, uh, a realization of. Uh, uh, a, a clear realization of what is happening in the world, mm-hmm. uh, then it is an untruth. Then it, uh, it's misinformation. Uh, I mean, this is what uh, uh, what Trump bank, uh, banks on, what, what the Republican Party in America and, or many politicians mm-hmm. bank on is that they can sell the Brooklyn Bridge to anyone uh, because uh, they are susceptible uh, to false, false, well, false truths or misinformation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is that clear? I, I don't somewhat, know. somewhat. I mean, uh, <laughs> one thing I would say is I don't. Uh, the the problem I would have is in in this um, removal of people from orthodox house or, or orthodox religious households or orthodox religious education. In what sense uh, does that move towards more more freedom or more? Uh, because because well, what, what what because you replace what they're learning mm. with a relative process, okay, mm-hmm. uh, which is truth mm-hmm. that will enable them to understand whether they're being taken advantage of uh, or given the possibility uh, to. Uh, uh, to lead their own lives mm-hmm. the way that they want to lead their own lives. Mm-hmm. In other words, uh, uh, you know, if you were born into a strict religious family, mm-hmm. uh, you must abide by the, the the rules of these strict religious families, or uh, otherwise you will be banned mm-hmm. or uh, uh, kicked out or uh, mm-hmm. demonized in, 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 in certain mm-hmm. ways. And uh, this is not uh, what truth is about. Mm-hmm. But it, but on the on the other hand, uh, if you're to then be born into this relative system of truth, which you posit, and you come yes. to the conclusions that God is real and true, you'll be equally kicked out of that that group of people. No, there's no. Uh, 
if you're going to have a, uh, there's no kicking out because there's no organization uh, uh, that, that you for, perhaps you form communities, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but you don't have to be in that in the community uh, because you believe in some strict rules or something like that. You for, you join a community in, in which people understand that life is. Uh, filled with relatives and, and uh, filled with possibilities that are much different from, let us say, organized, organized religions mm -hmm. that actually exploit, in my, my opinion, mm -hmm. exploit the people uh, uh, in, in their different churches, synagogues, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, if you look at history, uh, you you will see that most of the most vicious wars have to do with religion, uh, where religious leaders uh, uh, control and determine the lives of millions of people uh, in in wars, and and most wars start to a certain extent. Uh, because of religious factors, maybe a little different today, mm -hmm. but really not that much different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're you're a very uh, classical Marxist in the sense that it has to begin from, you know, was it Marx said that the door to the door to Marxism begins with atheism, the door to communism begins with atheism. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I'm a little more an anarch anarchist, uh, an anarchist. Okay. Uh, and, and I, like Bloch, and I don't believe that necessarily. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why do you, why do you think it is then that um, I mean, Bloch still isn't a big or a huge figure by any stretch within within teaching. You know, why do you think it is he yes. still hasn't taken big role? Or do you think he ever will? You know, do you think he's only someone yeah. you really come across if you are in <laughs> you know if you're into very uh, multiple diverging interests? Yes. He has an unusual style of writing, mm -hmm. uh, and and therefore it, it's not easy. Uh, also, the Frankfurt School, except for maybe uh, 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 maybe Walter Benjamin or uh, uh, some some of the other uh, other writers, uh, for instance, uh, Herbert Marcuse's writing style is very clear. That's not true with Bluff. Bluff mm -hmm. is an expressionist, and uh, uh, he he has uh, and, and a po somewhat of a poet poet, and so he likes to play with words. And it's very difficult. Some of his writing is easy to follow. A lot of his journalist writings in, early in his life, but uh, uh, he uh, is uh, constantly inventing new terms. Uh, and uh, uh, trying to, uh, let us say, uh, provoke and, and challenge readers. Mm -hmm. So it, it's difficult to read Bloch uh, and uh, uh, very difficult to translate Bloch, I must say, uh, which I've done. Uh, and I think, though, if you have the energy and willingness mm -hmm. Uh, to you know, to stay with it at the beginning, uh, then it becomes somewhat easy later on. Once you once you understand to uh, uh, what is a lot of his initial premises are, he'll introduce them in a very unusual way. Uh, uh, he wants you to rethink thinking, mm -hmm. and uh, in order to do that, uh, he's developed his a, a very personal style. Uh, that, to a certain extent, uh, reflects uh, the autonomy that he wants for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where would you, where would, other than your own book, which I would say is an extremely accessible place to begin, where would you advise people to begin with uh, Bloch's work? Uh, uh, yeah, there, there are there aren't there are some other books. I'm, 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 uh, Forgive me if, if I, I can't remember them mm -hmm. right now, but there are some good books, very good books in English, uh, uh, and uh, or or actually uh, uh, 
uh, uh, many, many the, in, in Germany, he is well known. And, and there there's, as I, as I pointed out before, there's a uh, uh, Ernst Bloch Society and they publish uh, uh, numerous books or uh, and uh, the meetings uh, in, uh, in Germany. But it's not you don't see that in France or England uh, uh, there. But there are there are some other books in, in, in English that, that uh, I refer to in my book uh, that are very, very helpful. OK, OK. Um, your book will be able to find, be able to be found by via the Palgrave Macmillan site or Amazon or probably many yes. other places. Um, and it's called uh, Ernst Bloch. The pugnacious philosopher of hope. I mean, uh, Jack Zipes, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, we've we've sort of covered mostly uh, Bloch's idea of hope, which is the big the big idea. I um, mean, is there anything you'd like to add in? Um, you know, before we finish up. Yes, uh, you 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 generally ask uh, who would you like to oh, have a conversation? Uh, a mythic question. I, you <laughs> you mentioned so many people at the start that I thought those would be the ones, but I'm, I'm happy to ask it now at the end. Um, yes. Yeah, three thinkers living or dead seated in a room and you can listen could, in. Um, could, blocks, could are, I, blocks already in there and then you three more. Yeah, yeah. Yes, could I uh, add a few more guests? Uh, yeah. not, too much, not, not many, but uh, so the, the people I would like to have in this room would be uh, Herbert Marcuse, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because of his one-dimensional uh, man and, and many other books and his closeness to, well, he, he was a member of, of the uh, uh, Frankfurt group. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the most complicated writer, Theodore Adorno, uh, uh, Hans Meyer, uh, who, mm -hmm. was, uh, who helped me out of New York to get this job, but it was a great uh, literary literature critic. And, uh, and then two unusual guests. Uh, one is Richard Dawkins, <laughs> uh, uh, whom uh, I've developed, you know, a method of uh, his meme, of the use of memes mm -hmm. uh, to understand why certain tales stick with us and uh, stay with us throughout our lives. And uh, um, using Richard Dawkins' uh, work uh, in uh, on on well not on memes but on genes, uh, uh, the work that he did on genes, and then he had, and he's the one who developed the notion of memes. And finally, uh, Ian McGill uh, McGillchrist. McGillchrist. Uh, he wrote a book called The Ma Yeah M Mick Gilchrist. Uh, Ian. Uh, he wrote a book called The Master and His Emissary. And I, I love his work because he, 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 it, it, uh, he does work on the, on the brain mm -hmm. and, and how uh, we, uh, part of our brain is uh, a very rigid and, and, and the left, uh, I don't know whether it's the left or the right, but uh, he, he did, his book is fascinating and helps also, exp uh, is attached to my meme theory. Uh, uh, how the brain works uh, uh, to uh, uh, store memes uh, and and to use those memes in our lives in a way uh, that may be somewhat different, uh, but nevertheless, these memes become stored in our brains, in the left brain or the right brain, and uh, enable us to understand what is going on in our lives and, and in the world. So do you, do you think that room would focus on how to utilize memes as a way almost for revolution, for the revolutionary spirit? Uh, could you repeat that question? Do you, do you think, do you think that room, you know, with all the people within that room, you know, oh, I see. Of, do you think, do you think it would, would turn, the conversation might turn into how all connecting into how can we use these small meme memetics and memes as a way to, you know, uh, promote revolutionary politics or certain forms yes. of politics? Well, not, not, not politics so much. I, I think <laughs> they, they would be fascinated uh, because all of them, uh, uh, all, all of these people in, in, in that room uh, really want, uh, uh, want students or readers or other people to become uh, more aware of how the world works and uh, uh, they they would be thrilled 
to uh, understand that there might be some scientific basis uh, for uh, their theories uh, that they could practically use uh, uh, or people could practically use after uh, they uh, would listen to their debate or conversation in this particular room. So I, I, I think that that one of the philosophers are, are uh, always looking for some basis, some scientific basis, uh, uh, in which to, uh, which would uh, sort of enable uh, enable them to speak to people. Mm-hmm. In, in other words, uh, they're looking for uh, a a even though they're own language is rather complicated and their ideas are rather complicated, uh, they uh, uh, would look to science to help them uh, communicate uh, with people who read their works uh, and uh, ground and, and see that their, their, their works, their philo- philosophical ideas are scientifically grounded. Mm-hmm. I was going to say there's not a hint of God in that room. No, <laughs> no, I, uh, I doubt it. I doubt it. Mm-hmm. So, you, has that been? Uh, you know, you, you're quite an anarchic figure, but has that been maybe an overarching aim of yourself? Is you know, all this time protesting and the activism of your younger days, has that been something that's always been in the background? The idea of how can this form of uh, social hope, in the blocking sense, have a have a rigorous foundation? Which, which allows you to understand it in some uh, evolutionary sense. Yes, I, I, I think so. Uh, if I may say that, you know, for 20 years, I de- I, I've worked, I developed my own storytelling method. Uh, and I had a program at the Children's Theatre Company in Minneapolis for 20 years. And I've trained about... 150 young people uh, to go into schools and to use my methods uh, to enable children to become storytellers of their own lives. The, the, the basic philosophy uh, uh, of my method is to use literacy uh, in a way that children will uh, uh, feel that they can voice their own opinions, develop their own opinions, share their own opinions among themselves in a school with uh, all different types of people or people from from uh, different belief systems. Mm-hmm. And all, and my hope <laughs> is in th- in this type of work that uh, that uh, more people, more of us. Again, um, uh, it gets back to you know what I was talking about education and children and that mm. children is where we have to start that uh, the more we listen to children and work off the children mm. then I have hope we might be able to develop a society that is much more let us say humane makes complete sense I think that's uh, I think that's a pretty uh, hopeful place to to, to finish up. Um, yes. Jack Zipes, thanks very much. Well, thank you for this conversation. It's been great.